All right, we're gonna talk about raw food a little bit because I, being a past raw foodist for four and a half years, I somehow survived on a raw food diet. Um, I'm interested in this. I'm interested in whether people can actually live on raw food. And I'm, of course, reading the book um, Catching Fire, as I've uh, stated in my last video, by Richard Rangham, How Cooking Made Us Human. And he makes a pretty good case that raw foodism could not really exist in, in, in reality, in nature, without the kind of conveniences of modern times. So he's talking here about these Giesen raw food studies. There's a couple out there um, that I found. I found this one here, and then I found another one, which I'll show in a sec. And um, this one, anyway, looked at long-term raw food diet on body weight and menstruation. And basically... Um, the conclusion is the consumption of raw food diet is associated with a high loss of body weight since many raw food dieters exhibited underweight and amenorrhea, which means you're not getting a period. A very strict raw food diet cannot be recommended on a long-term basis. And then this is another one by the same author, Kobnik, Karina Kobnik, and it's about the raw food diet associated with favorable serum LDL cholesterol. Of course, we would know that, I think. I think that's pretty obvious. Triglycerides, but also with elevated plasma homocysteine and low serum HDL cholesterol. Now, homocysteine is related to B12. So basically, again, it says 38% of the raw foodists were B12 deficient, probably not supplementing, let's be honest. Um, 12% had an increased mean corpuscle volume. And then certain markers um, were higher in those with the lowest quantile consumption of animal foods. Because some of these raw foodists ate animal foods. But it basically says this study indicates that consumption of a strict raw food diet lowers plasma total cholesterol and triglyceride concentrations, but also lowers serum HDL and increases total uh, homocysteine concentrations due to B12 deficiency. So... Yeah, just again, another Giesen study, but I'm going to read a little bit about what um, Richard Rangham says in here. So he's describing the studies. So I think it's important to note that raw food included not only uncooked vegetables and occasional meat, but also cold-pressed oil and honey. Um, and some items that were lightly heated, such as dried fruits, dried meat, and dried fish. So that's important. These people were not just eating, you know, fruit and stuff. They even had oil, which, you know, in theory should make it even easier to keep your weight on. So it says, in the Giesen study, the more raw food that women ate, the lower their BMI and the more likely they were to have partial or total amenorrhea. So it's kind of like a linear relationship, right? Eat more raw food, get less weight on your body, but also like to the point of losing your period. Among women eating totally raw diets, about 50% entirely ceased to menstruate, half of them. And then another 10% suffered irregular menstrual cycles that left them unlikely to conceive. These figures are far higher than women eating cooked food. And even vegetarians on cooked food diets rarely fail to menstruate. Um, so that's a, a big indication that raw food diets aren't very healthy. And this is an important part. Most raw foodists prepare their food elaborately in ways that increase their energy value. Techniques include mild heating, blending, grinding, and sprouting. Any system of reducing the size of food particles, such as grinding and crushing, leads to predictable increases in energy gain. The German raw foodists also had the advantage of eating oils produced commercially by industrial processing. And here in the German study, 30% of the subject's calories came from these lipids, a valuable energy source that would not have been available to hunter-gatherers. And this is the important part, right? These people have an advantage over people living out in the bush or in, you know, without the conveniences of modern living. And there's no way, there's no way I could see that this would be possible without these 
conveniences. It would be very, very difficult unless I guess you eat mostly nuts like the Kung, but even the Kung cook. And he also points out the fact that, you know, not a lot of these German raw foodists did not exercise that much. So they had the um, advantage in that way that they didn't have to expend all this energy. But if you're out in the wild, you can't not move around. You can't not do that. So that's another point that just indicates that you, like these raw food diets would not be a, possible at all in the bush. So he talks about the Inuit. We're not going to go over that part, but basically the Inuit do cook. So when he says that, when raw foodists tell you, well, the Inuit don't cook, um, that's not true. They do. So we're just going to bypass that whole kind of theory. But this is a case of um, a Scottish author and sailor who survived with his family being adrift at sea um, <laughs> for quite a while. And we're looking for kind of ad examples of people having to survive on raw food and whether they were able to. Now here, um, this individual, uh, Dug Dugal Robertson, in 1972, he, he and his family lost their boat, boat to killer whales in the Pacific and were confined to a dinghy for 38 days. So first they had cookies and oranges and candy, but... By the seventh day, they were forced to eat what they could catch. They spent their last 31 days at sea, mostly eating raw turtle meat, turtle eggs, and fish. So raw meat seems to be um, potentially, a, you know, seems to maybe allow people to survive longer in, um, you know, lost at sea. I guess this would be more fish type or turtles and stuff like that. Um so meat, I can see. I can see that if you could catch enough meat. However, it seems as though a lot of hunter-gatherers can't always do that. It says, though, that they caught more food than they could eat, and they survived in good cheer. Indeed, their diet suited them so well but that by the end of their ordeal, Robertson reported that their physical condition was actually better than when they had begun their journey. Okay. Um, so sores that had been present... Um, when their boat had sunk, had healed, and their bodies were functioning effectively. Except for nine, the nine-year-old boy, even though he was given extra portions of barren, bone marrow, was disturbingly thin. That's really interesting, eh? That the adults could survive, but the children really not able to. So now we're going to move on to a different story. And this is a woman named Helena Valero. And basically... Uh, this exceptional woman, I'm reading from the book again, was a Brazilian of European descent who reportedly survived in a remote forest for some seven months in the 1930. She knew the jungle well because of at about the age of 12, she had been kidnapped by the Yanamamo Indians. Uh, she became a member of their tribe, but her experience was very bad. One day after her life was threatened, she escaped her captors. She took firebrand wrapped in leaves, but she could... Uh, so she could cook, but after a few days of heavy rain, um, of heavy drain, rain drenched it. Unwilling to return to the Yanamamo Ma life, she wandered alone, fireless and increasingly hungry, until she found an abandoned banana plantation. Valero was lucky because villages had, villagers had planted the trees in a dense grove. There, she said, she survived by eating raw bananas. She counted the, the seven months by the passage of the moon. She did not record her condition at the end of her exile, but she was eventually found by Yanamamo. She returned to the comforts of village life, married twice, had four children, and eventually feared for her children's lives and escaped again at about age 35. So, bananas. But bananas are not a wild food. The wild version of a banana is very um, dense with seeds. I've seen them actually in Costa Rica. They're, I mean, you can put them in your mouth and swirl it around and try to spit out all the seeds, but it's not like a banana where you can just eat it or even better yet, blend it up. So again, these are people surviving, quote unquote, on raw foods for a long time, but on cultivated foods. Is there really any raw wild foods that you could truly survive just on raw wild foods? And are there any populations of people who have ever survived on 
actual raw foods? Are there any tribes who survive on the actual raw foods? No, they don't exist. And the reason is we need to cook our food. That's, that's how we survive. We need to live off of foods that are much more dense in energy. Even cultivated fruit works better than, um, you know, the raw version, raw and wild, I guess you would say. Okay, we're going to just go over one more story. So this is a really interesting story, and it was told by um, anthropologist Alan Holmberg, and he was on a remote mission in Bolivia in the 1940s. And it's about these um, Siriono hunter-gatherers. And it's interesting that a hunter-gatherer tribe, I don't know if this was them, I just looked up Bolivia hunter-gatherers, but a hunter-gatherer tribe struggled to stay alive in the wild without fire. So they were so hungry and emaciated. So these hunter-gatherers arrived from the forest. They were so hungry and emaciated that, as one of them told Holmberg, if they had not arrived when they did, they might have died. This group had been part of a band that had thrived in the rainforest until they were taken to a government school. They'd been so resentful of their forced removal that they had escaped with the aim of returning to their ancestral homeland. To avoid capture, they had had moved fast, walking even in heavy rain. Without proper cover, the smoldering logs they were carrying were extinguished. After that, the little group was reduced to a raw diet of wild plants until they were rescued after three weeks. They walked less than five miles per day, and even though they knew the forest intimately and found raw plants to eat, they still could not obtain sufficient energy from their diets. Two of the men had bows, and there was lots of game, so they might have done better, but for a taboo... Um, but for a taboo on raw meat, which they claimed not to eat under any conditions. So there's a huge downfall, right? The raw meat probably would have kept them going. But interesting that the plants definitely were not keeping them going. But it says here, but even hunter gatherers often live well with little um, meat for weeks on end as long as they cook. So the Siriono experience suggests that raw diets are dangerous because they do not provide enough energy. So anyway, I don't know about you, but this provides me enough kind of information to know that it would be very difficult, I think, to survive in the wild um, without without fire. And before I go, actually, I want to talk about one more thing, because um, I know some of the raw foodists are going to be like, but fruit, but fruit, we can survive on fruit. And um, he does actually talk a lot about fruit as well. Mainly, he talks about our differences in, you know, um, mouth, jaw, teeth, stomachs, small colons, small guys. We have small everything compared to primates, basically. And I'll just read one section here. The difference in mouth size is even more obvious when we take the lips into account. The amount of food a chimpanzee can hold in its mouth far exceeds what humans can do because in addition to their wide gape and, and big mouths, chimpanzees have enormous and very muscular lips. When eating juicy foods like fruit or meat, chimpanzees use their lips to hold a large wad of food in the upper part of their mouths and squeeze it hard against their teeth, which they may do repeatedly for many minutes before swallowing. The strong lips are probably an adaptation for eating fruits because fruit bats have similarly large and muscular lips that they use in the same way to squeeze fruit wads against their teeth. Humans have relatively tiny lips appropriate for a small amount of food in the mouth at one time. Another important part here is evolutionary adaptation to cooking might likewise explain why humans seem less prepared to tolerate toxins than do other apes. In my experience of sampling many wild foods eaten by primates, items eaten by chimpanzees in the wild taste better than foods eaten by monkeys. Even so, some of the fruits, seeds, and leaves that chimpanzees select taste so foul that I can barely swallow them. The tastes are strong and rich, excellent indicators of the presence of non-nutritional compounds, many of which we are like are likely to be toxic to humans, but presumably much less to so to chimpanzees. And then he goes on to describe certain fruits, like the Warburgia fruits contain a spicy compound reminiscent of a mustard oil. The hot taste renders even a single fruit impossibly un un unpleasant for humans to ingest, but chimpanzees can eat a pile of these fruits and then look eagerly for more. And then a lot of their fruit is very astringent, apparently. And um, when tasting chimpanzees fruit, such as mimusops, 
Mimusops bagshawe, or the widespread, I'm not even going to try to pronounce these guys, um, chimpanzees can eat more than a kilogram of such fruits during an hour or more of continuous chewing. We cannot. And then they eat a lot of figs and some of their figs are super bitter. So anyway, this is just um, another reason why this whole raw food fantasy, just like paleo fantasy, it doesn't exist. Sorry, guys. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a myth and humans cannot survive on raw food.